Hello, this is David again. Oh boy, this is so satisfying. But once again, I keep getting these distressing comments. And uh, I just want to address another one of them. Because uh, people seem to think what I did yesterday was helpful. A fair number of people. So maybe this will be helpful if I do the same thing again with this one. And um, in any case, I'm just going to go ahead and read this comment. Read my response and comment on it. And uh, maybe this one won't be 45 minutes long. Because this is uh, similar to what I commented on yesterday. All right. This is from a what sounds like a wonderful man by the name of Samuel Jepson, and my heart absolutely goes out to him. Um, he commented, David, I really appreciate your feelings. No one fought harder than me. But you have a lot of gall saying anti-Mormon lies if you don't know they are. I trusted like a child, too, for 72 years. Plausible liars? So tell me, which version of the first vision do you like best? <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, that's, uh, that's Samuel's question. Honest question deserves an honest answer. And uh, so, good question. Which version of the first vision do I like best? Oh. oh, man. Okay, I'm just going to read my reply to him. And once again, Samuel, if I'm exaggerating for effect, don't think I'm mocking you. Believe me, my heart goes out to you. I've been where you're at in many times and ways and places, and it's always a miserable place to be, and my heart absolutely goes out to you. So uh, please don't take offense if I get a bit dramatic. It's just the way I am. I don't mean any offense by it. So anyway, I'm going to read his little question again, and I'm, then I'm going to immediately read my response. Samuel, David, I really appreciate your feelings. No one fought harder than me, but you have a lot of gall saying anti-Mormon lies, if you don't know they are. I trusted like a child, too, for 72 years. Plausible liars? So tell me, which version of the first vision do you like best? Dear Samuel, sadly, you totally missed the point. The tree is lovely. The leaders are incredible. The covenant path, highway of holiness, is amazing and safe. And the destination is beyond all imagination, glorious. And the spirit that leads us on the covenant path is a spirit of childlike trust. And what does a little child believe? Whatever daddy tells him. And Heavenly Father speaks to the Lord Jesus Christ, who speaks to his apostles, those who he has sent. John 10, 39. He who receives you, receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. That's what Jesus Christ said about his apostles. Which, of course, can also be stated by Christ. I follow Heavenly Father. And if you follow my apostles, who I have sent, you're following after me. And will end up with me and with the Heavenly Father who sent me. So you know which version of the first vision I like best, Samuel? I believe whichever version the general authorities tell me to believe. And I don't even need to know all the versions or all the contending ideas about such things. I simply don't care about it. Why should I? I'm just a trusting child, following in childlike trust, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forth to what lies ahead and pressing towards the mark of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm fully occupied with speaking the truth in love. And with my new friends, growing up into him, into Christ in all things, who is the head, even Christ. We're walking down a covenant path of love and glory together towards our Heavenly Father. 
And you think I should come down off that glorious road to try to find the truth about that stuff, about such stuff? Why? To what good end? So I can lose my faith like you? It's laughable, Samuel, and unutterably sad. You've been duped. Come back. I don't have any desire to look back and know all this stuff that they, whoever they are, Mm. are supposedly keeping from me. I know, Samuel, beyond any doubt at all, just where all such voices of such spirit and flavor come from, they come from the pit of hell, from outer darkness, and bear the fruit of outer darkness, destroying childlike faith, which is the most precious thing on earth, wherever such voices are listened to. Such voices and hidden knowledge, falsely so-called, Samuel, are bad trees that bear the worst fruit imaginable. So, no, I don't even need to know about competing versions of the first vision. I don't even need to know it, about it. I don't even need to know about it. What joy, what simplicity, what glory. And as for my gall, even without knowing or caring about such things, which I will never care to spend one minute on doing, I mean, after all, what's the point? What good will it do anybody to care about such things? I still have the right and command from the Word of God to speak the truth in love with all my heart, and I will never stop doing so. Samuel, I'm so childlike and crazy. I would have no problem believing that the Holy, that in the Holy Ghost, all the different versions of the first vision are true. <laughs> true in truth and true to a Greek are two very different things. It's only intellectual Greek thinking, skepticism, that has a hard time with this. Read the Bible. If you just read the four Gospels, you find dozens of things that Jesus said and did in the accounts of them in the four Gospels that are very different from each other. You know what? I believe them all. Without childlike faith, no one can enter the kingdom of God. And childlike faith is the true Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to leave the letter here for a minute. I digress. You may wonder what I'm talking about with this Greek thinking, you know. <laughs> but it's helpful to understand something. And I don't pretend to be an authority on this, but this has really helped me. Our cultural heritage is largely Greek. Greek and Roman. You can see it in law, government, philosophy, all kinds of things. But it's very much our heritage in our minds. The Romans were great admirers and imitators of the Greeks. They took on Greek culture and added their own veneer and layers to it. But the Greeks were in their heads. Things were intellectual. Um, skepticism was a big part of Greek culture. It was considered really admirable to, to not really believe anything was objectively true, to be able to argue one side of something and then turn around and, and you know prove or disprove it and then immediately go to the other side and do the same thing as if there's no objective truth everything's intellectual all right and this is that kind of knowledge you know just the idea that there's you know tell me the facts <laughs> you know there's lies damn lies statistics and then there's supposed facts so you want to find out the facts about the different versions of the first vision and which one's factual but to a greek well it's obvious that really the fact is that we've been lied to because there's different versions of the first vision well that's that has nothing to do with reality it, it's like you know, like you think you can read history that's factual? You're dreaming. All history is written by the victors, you know. But in our Father, our Father 
through his word, he can give accounts of things, and he can give different accounts of things. And if you're actually spiritual and you think like our Father does, you can just accept them all. And you can learn different things from every one of them. This is what I've done with the Bible and with the Gospels for 47 years. If I had thought like you're thinking about which of these visions or versions of the first vision are true, this is a reason why you should just distrust uh, the church. <laughs> I mean, if I thought like that when I first started... When I first got my hands on a Bible at 21, I'm like, man, there's something true on the earth. And I started reading it. And I'm like, wow, what it says Jesus said in this particular event in John is different than Luke, is different than Mark, is different than Matthew. Oh, my, I think I'll just become an atheist. None of this is true. That's not how it works, okay? I want to be like our Heavenly Father. I want to be like a little child. I want to be like... David was when he was out there under the stars, just taking care of the sheep and loving the sheep and giving the sheep his full attention and getting to know the sheep and, you know, playing songs and singing to the sheep. You know, our father doesn't think like that. He's not concerned about facts. He's concerned about love and togetherness and childlike trust that allows people to have that same spirit. The spirit of childlike trust is also the spirit of selfless love that actually brings about complete togetherness and oneness and brings people onto a covenant path that allows them to actually fulfill their divine potential. It's all the same package, man. You can't give up childlike faith and trust and still have the Holy Ghost and become who you were created to be and and this is just how it is all right so this this is this is just a little illustration that i've used to myself and other people for many years the difference between the childlike thinking of a true seed, someone who's truly of the seed of abraham i mean what was abraham he's 75 man he's in ur he just hears in his heart from our father go and he's like father is that you you want me to go where how when you want me to go where our father's like you don't need to know just go <laughs> and abraham he's so childlike he's like sarah it's we're selling that we're selling the mansion in ur we're gonna get some camels we're gonna saddle them up with some tents and we're just gonna go and she's like what where? He's like, we don't need to know. She was up for it. Are you kidding me? Are they crazy? No. That's, that's faith. That's childlike faith. Childlike trust, Samuel. No one will enter the kingdom of God with any other spirit than that good spirit of childlike trust, which is also the spirit of selfless love that brings about real togetherness, okay? And so if, if David, when he was a boy, or even when he was king, okay, he decides, I really, I don't know why, but I had this dream about frogs last night. I think it was from our father, and I just really want to know frogs. And of course, to a Hebrew, you know, the Hebrew word for know means to become one with, as in, Adam knew his wife, and Seth was born, you know. <laughs> to know is to become one with. So if David wanted to know frogs, even if he was king, or if he was a boy, you know what he would have done? He would have done just what he did that caused him to know sheep when he was a boy. He would have just gone and camped by the side. He would have found a wonderful frog pond. And just lived next to the frog pond and given his full attention to the life of the frogs in and around the frog pan pond for maybe a year. At the end of the year, King David would know frogs in the true sense of knowing the truth about frogs. Okay? Beautiful. Now, he would understand and essentially as much as a human being can be one with the frogs. All right? All right, but this this Greek thinking, if a Greek, if a wealthy Greek in Athens, 
he got the same idea. I really want to understand. I really want to know frogs. It wouldn't even occur to him to go live by a frog pond. No. He'd hire some flunky to go catch a bucket of frogs. And he would pin them all up on boards and dissect them. And then take all their body parts and pin them up on boards. And then carefully consider what Latin names to give the different frog body parts. And then he'd compile all that in an index or a book of some kind. And then he would publish that. He would be the Greek expert on frogs. He doesn't know anything about frogs. He knows nothing about frogs. He's got a whole book of facts about frogs. The average weight of a frog liver. It's stupid. It's absolutely stupid. And you know, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to throw stones at anybody because I have been so stu I've been more stupid than anybody in the history of the world more times, I think. I'm the stupidest man on earth, okay? So I'm, I'm not trying to talk down to you, uh, Samuel. But all I know is that when I allow myself to get into that kind of thinking that just wants to dissect things and pick things, let's, let's look at the roots, the dark roots, and the competing, the competing versions of the first vision. I believe them all. Unless the prophet says, don't believe them all. And then you know what? I don't believe them all. Well, what do I believe, Daddy? He's like, well, just think about it like this. This is the one that we've decided is the most accurate. Just believe that one. Or wait, whatever they, I don't care. I don't care. Why should I care? I just want, to, you know, you know when I'm going to, how you're going to get my fingers. I, I've grabbed a hold of the prophet of the Latter-day Saints Church and his counselors and the Quorum of Twelve and the Seventy. I've grabbed a hold of that man's shoulder. And if he dies, I'll grab a hold of the next one's shoulder. You know when you're going to get my fingers off of that man's shoulder? I'm going wherever he goes. I'm going to believe whatever he says. Because he's the one that our Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ, has sent. And to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and to receive the Father, I have to receive the one he sent. He's the one he sent. You're going to get my hands off of his shoulder when you pry my cold, dead fingers off of it. <laughs> okay? And that's just what childlike trust does, is hold on to daddy. <laughs> you know, I'm holding on to daddy. It's that simple, Samuel. You don't have to. You know, I understand you fought the good fight. It's glorious that you fought the good fight till you were 72. But why stop now? Just hold on to the prophet. And, and whatever he says about the, the different versions of the first vision, you got a better idea than just to believe God's prophet? I don't think so. Has it brought you peace and joy and righteousness? Okay, that's my digression. Right? That's the whole Greek. And it, both of those things are in both of us. And you know what? There's a lot more Greek than there is seed of Abraham in our souls, culturally speaking. So we really have to be on guard against this Greek garbage, because like, like Paul addresses in one place, he says, look, knowledge, speaking of knowledge in the Greek sense of the word, facts, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Childlike trust and the spirit of selfless love doesn't care about facts. All I care about is how can I build up this kingdom of childlike trust and selfless love that's going to take everybody who's willing to go to glory. <laughs> Why should I care about anything else? Life's too short, especially when you're 68, man, and you're 72. Life's too short, you know? Come back to childlike faith. All right, let me finish this letter. Okay. Read the Bible, Samuel. If you just read the four Gospels, you'll find dozens of things that Jesus said and did in the accounts of them in the four Gospels that are very different from each other. You know what? I believe them all. Without childlike faith, no one can enter the kingdom of God. And childlike faith is the true Holy Ghost. So you want me to throw the Holy Ghost out of my heart and soul and mind? 
grieve the Holy Ghost out of my life to join you in trying to sort out and supposedly find out the real truth about such things? Samuel, I've been incredibly stupid far more times than I could even count. But thankfully, I've learned a bit from my countless huge mistakes over the last 47 years. What is wise is holding on to childlike faith at all costs. It's a joyful place to abide, and it's sad that anyone who has such faith would allow themselves to be moved off of that glorious place for any reason whatsoever, no matter how reasonable it might seem to your natural mind and to the Greek side of who you are culturally. you you got to crucify that stuff. Crucify that stuff. And just be as a little child. Childlike trust. I love you, Samuel, and I hope you can simply repent and find your way back through the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the mercy that flows from it. The true truth is, regarding any versions of the first vision, is to simply rest in knowing. And I don't even need to know about it. What joy, what simplicity, what glory. Samuel, I'm so childlike and crazy, I would have no problem believing that in the Holy Ghost, all the different versions of the first vision are true. Whatever the prophet says, guess what? I'm buying it in spades. Every bit of it, joyfully, and I'm not being tricked in doing so. It is those who don't have this attitude that are truly being tricked. It's only intellectual Greek thinking that has a hard time with this. And that spirit of intellectual Greek thinking, read, skepticism, is utterly opposed to and actually designed by the evil one to destroy all childlike faith and lead those who listen to it fully into outer darkness. If you let yourself be taken captive by this spirit now, what are the chances you won't also be taken captive by it at the end of the millennium and join Satan in trying to destroy the city of God? Wake up, please, wake up. I love you heaps, Samuel, and I'm not throwing stones at you. The evil one has been at this for a long time and hates the Latter-day Saints with consuming passion and knows how to appeal to the Greek side of our cultural inheritance and move us off of the only safe place to stand. So if any of us think we stand, we better take heed lest we fall and hold on to tighter and defend with everything in us our precious childlike faith, which is the Holy Ghost. I hope and pray you can find a path back to your first love, that you can find true repentance and recover childlike trust, which you gloriously fought to hold on to and did hold on to for so very long, which is such a glorious credit to you, Samuel. But it's such a shame that after so long you would leave the dock just when your ship is about to come over the horizon. You're needed. Our Father needs you on the covenant path with, with his people. Faith and repentance is a gift from our Father. And if you ask him and simply break your heart before him in doing so, he will give it to you. A thousand times out of a thousand, our Father draws near to whoever is of a broken and contrite heart. I just suggest you read Psalm 51 and imitate David's example and find your way back to that beautiful, joyful place of childlike trust and clinging with all your heart to your apostolic and prophetic leaders that are the greatest gift of God on the face of the earth and they're worthy of trust and they're worth holding on to and not letting go till death do you part. And of course, that won't part you either. Then you just keep going to glory. Much love, David. Whew.